Hello and welcome to On Point. I'm Candace Curtis. Domestic violence is a willful intimidation by an intimate partner against another. These assaults can take place in many forms, physical, sexual, and emotional. It is an epidemic affecting individuals in every community, regardless of age, economic status, race, religion, nationality, or educational background. Communication and Gender Studies, Professor Randy Piccarelli says sometimes she sees a link between violence and gender. I think domestic violence is about power, and I think that historically men have been in relationships uh, with, in heterosexual relationships, with partners um, whom they dominated financially uh, and economically, right, and obviously physically. Um, I, I think we have a tendency to look at things like testosterone or look at you know, men's biological makeup as if domestic violence is somehow in their bodies. And I don't think that's the case. I think that culturally we are raising men to um, be more violent. We live in a culture that justifies violence. And we also live in a culture that justifies entitlement over women's bodies. Hypermasculinity, the, um, the increase in body size, the idea that being a man is connected to putting somebody else down. You know, one of our notions of, of masculinity, for example, is that to be a man is to disassociate from anything feminine. But not only women are victims. Two in every five men are abused in an intimate relationship. CSUN student Alex Vejar says he experienced physical and emotional abuse. When my ex-girlfriend was uh, abusive, not, not only was she physically abusive, but she was uh, also like psychologically abusive and emotionally abusive. She would, um, you know, there were things that she would lie to me about that later, that they were like big things. Like she told me that my mom cheated on my dad. Um, and I like hated my mom for like a long time. And she, when she told me that she lied about it some months later, you know, that kind of, that takes away the trust. And uh, you know, when you're, when you're physically abused by somebody, that also takes a toll on you emotionally. I, was, I would blame myself for everything that went wrong, even though it probably wasn't my fault. You know, um, I jumped through hoops about things that she wanted me to do that I didn't really want to do or I didn't think I had to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was like really glad when it ended. On Point's Daniel Max has more. Thank you, Candace. Our first guest is Teresa Knott, an associate professor at CSUN specializing in violence against women and children. Next is Lilania, an interpersonal abuse survivor. And finally, Detective Stephanie Diaz, lead detective specializing in sexual assault and major assault crimes. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my first question is for Lilania. Um, when did the abuse you encountered first, be first begin? Uh, well, at, shortly after I, I got married. I, I got married at a really young age. I was 19, and um, we had dated less than a year before we uh, got married. And I would say probably about three months into our marriage. What was it that made him so angry? What was the problem? You know, it, it, looking back at it now, was just um, jealousy. It stemmed from jealousy. That's what it manifested at that time from, but I'm sure it came from something that, you know, he was dealing with that I just didn't realize at the time. And what specifically was the abuse? Was it physical, emotional, both? It was both. It started out as a, emotional abuse um, uh, and verbal abuse, and then it led to physical abuse. Um, Detective Diaz, how often do you see domestic abuse cases when you're out in the field? Every day. There's several uh, in Demetria area, which is the Northridge area, Chatsworth, Reseda, um, at least, at least 10 to 20 radio calls involving domestic violence. Uh, Teresa, we saw a soundbite earlier where an expert was talking about this at, at this concept of hypermasculinity. Do cultural pressures placed on men contribute to domestic violence, in your opinion? I don't know that I would say cultural pressures do. I think that uh, individuals who were raised in an environment that is focused on patriarchy are more at risk of becoming perpetrators of violence. Um, and are there certain communities more prone to domestic abuse and violence? 
I don't know that there's any individual community that's more prone. I think, as I mentioned previously, uh, societies and communities that are more likely to endorse a patriarchal family environment would be more at risk of domestic violence. So it transcends um, socioeconomics well, to some extent. Well, socioeconomic status, poverty is related to domestic violence, but it's a global problem. I think we need to think of it as an international problem, and it doesn't reside necessarily in one individual community. Detective Diaz, how often do you see domestic abuse instances involving alcohol or drugs? A lot. Usually that's a precursor to the domestic violence. So, for example, um, if people start to drink and they drink to excess, then they lose their inhibitions and then the littlest thing could set them off if, you're there, um, if that one person is the abuser. And then an argument usually ensues and then domestic violence usually happens. Well, Lenya, was that your experience with your ex-husband? I would say that um, it's interesting that um, it, you mention the higher patriarchal mm -hmm. um, in the family and uh, alcohol, Danny, because um, those were two factors that I think had a role in why he did what he did. Um, he actually was raised um, in that environment where um, the mother stayed at home and his father was actually a, a police officer and um, he was um, I guess they were very uh, controlled and in a controlled environment and um, and as the detective brought out alcohol they lose their inhibitions and I think that through the jealousy whatever he was experiencing made him, you know, uh, more susceptible to violence um, as time went on. Uh, Teresa, what exactly is domestic abuse theory? Well, uh, we know that uh, domestic abuse, which we really refer to as intimate partner violence, is related to control. Right? And uh, the degree to which an individual feels that the environment is out of their control, the more likely they are to uh, attempt to um, bring it back in within sort of their context. So uh, we know control is related to domestic violence and as our guest has indicated, typically families who have a uh, sort of an upbringing that is rigid and again more focused on patriarchal values, those families may be at risk. It's not that they are likely to become perpetrators of violence, but those males in particular are at risk of becoming perpetrators of violence. Now, obviously, um, you, you were married. Did you ever feel uh, like you were trying to justify in your head why he was doing this, or did you ever um, try to protect him from authorities? Yes, there came a time that that, that occurred. I mean, obviously, it's very shocking um, when you have never experienced anything like that before and it's your spouse and um, you know taking that commitment very seriously I think that the abuser also plays on any insecurities you might have or to in order to dominate you in and like you brought out and control that environment so there's a lot of things that they'll try to do to um, keep you in that situation and um, I, I don't know I mean I can say that being young was probably a factor for me um, in staying but it it led to um, you know, gr turn into uh, a worse situation where I had to call the police and and upon doing so, it, you know, there was a lot of threats and by the time uh, that occurred, it was much later on in our marriage um, and at that point I, I knew that it, I had to uh, end it and, uh, but I did try to protect him and say, well, I think it's because he was, you know, drinking and I think it was because of this and because of that and I don't want it to be, you know, I don't want him to go to jail, but I definitely knew, like, that our marriage had to end at that point um, for me.
Detective Diaz, is it common to see the abused try to defend their abusive partner when the police arrive to the scene? Yes. Well, initially what happens is when the victim has been abused, they'll cooperate with us usually. Rarely do we have um, victims that say, I don't want to cooperate initially when they've actually called the police. Um, usually if someone else has called the police, then, you know, they may not cooperate initially. But for the most part, they're shocked, hurt, in disbelief that this happened to them, so they'll tell us everything that happens. But with the cycle of violence, he'll apologize, he'll say, um, I'm saying he because it's mostly a male who's the abuser. We have some female abusers, obviously, that abuse their um, husbands. Um, but he'll apologize, he'll buy gifts, he'll say, I'll never do it again. It's that cycle of violence. So she, she'll feel, well, you know, I love him. We can work it out, we'll fix it. And then at, by the time detectives make contact with her, she'll, she'll say, no, I don't want to proceed. I don't want him to go to jail. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything with this case. And Teresa, what are some of the reasons why people stay in abusive relationships? And, and how exactly do the resources of the abused play into that? I think women stay because they want to keep themselves and their children safe. I mean, that's the number one uh, reason, at least in, in my research, my understanding is that's the number one reason that a woman would stay, to keep herself alive. Uh, in addition to that, women are often dependent on their male partners and that dependence contributes to their decision to stay. Um, additionally, some women develop a sense of empathy towards the perpetrator, and this is referred to as traumatic um, uh, bonding theory. And so women may uh, ha make excuses for the perpetrator and uh, condone the behavior as a result of the development of a sense of empathy um, we have seen this previously in the Stockholm Syndrome, so uh, individuals who are experiencing a traumatic event may um, develop some alignment with the perpetrator of violence. Uh, Lelania, why not just leave immediately when you were in that situation? And then what did it take? What was the catalyst that made you finally say, this is enough, I got to get out of this? I think for me it was um, not wanting to fail at my marriage and thinking that, you know, just making justification for the fact that he was drinking when this occurred and that it, it the uh, violence didn't escalate to a point to where I felt um, was horrific, even though at the time it was shocking and, and hurtful and, um, and, and after he said he would stop, he did for a long period of time. And then when it occurred again, it was 10 times worse and out of nowhere. And I think that's when I realized that, you know, it's not going to work. And he would, you know, said, I'll never do this again and, and, and begged and, and wouldn't let me go. But that, that, in that, in that instance, um, we had a daughter and she was a little older and I thought I never want her to see anything take place and and for we I wouldn't say we separated briefly but he really then you know said I would he would never do anything and this didn't occur in front of her and she didn't know and it was at nighttime and I again because I didn't I felt like where am I gonna go even though I was working full-time and we had a business and we had money but he had control over the money and I really did feel dependent on him for some reason and I could again say maybe that was my age and inexperience um, and thinking that I couldn't just pick up and leave um, even though I told him I'm not gonna stand for that and I'm going to leave um, and I think a, a longer period of time went on before something occurred again and at that point I was older and I think that by then um, something had occurred in front of our daughter enough to where I felt that I have to protect her before I uh, you know, regardless of what I feel or what I'm scared of or what I've been scared of in the past and why I wouldn't leave. And 
I made a decision at that point to get my things in order and separate you know our our money situation our home situation everything in order to say that that's it and it wasn't something that um, it was shocking enough and it was it was a hit to the arm that I in in her response that she had never seen that about that time she would she was probably about eight years old by then and um, I just was mortified I was mortified and I thought I just don't want her to think that that is okay and that was it detective Diaz just to switch gears why are house calls regarding domestic violence particularly dangerous for police officers because they're very volatile and um, just as we discussed a little bit earlier there are so many feelings going on you have the anger the rage but then you know the victim loves their spouse so um, usually when it's such a volatile situation when we go there we try to separate the parties calm them down and then find out exactly what happened but say and it happens a lot say the abuser doesn't calm down and then they start fighting with us a lot of times the victim will come to the defense and the aid of the abuser because again all those different emotions and that they're experiencing but yet um, a lot of times they see us as the enemy because we're there to try to help the situation. Now what about situations where a couple where both both members of the relationship are hitting each other um, and do you, will, will even the dominant one or the, or the larger one or the man claim self-defense and, and how do you assess the situation and determine which party is responsible and who gets arrested? Yes, that happens quite often. Um, we try to determine who was the dominant aggressor, meaning who was the one who maybe caused the most severe injuries. And sometimes it is it is the wife um, or the girlfriend. Uh, we've had several examples where, um, of course, obviously when there's conflicting statements, one you know when the the husband says one thing and then the wife says another, it's it's difficult. Then we'll go based on the severe se severity of the injuries. Um, but usually um, it does happen where uh, the wife is the dominant aggressor where she actually picked up an object and struck him. Um, she may have said self-defense, um, which a lot of times they'll, she'll say, oh, he slapped me first or pushed me and then I picked this object up and caused a more severe injury on, on um, her husband. In that situation, uh, it could, again, depending on the situation, uh, we'll take her if he has more severe injuries uh, again it just it depends on the situation it's each case by case uh, but the rule is the dominant aggressor who's the one who caused the most um, or who is capable of causing the most injuries Elena well, did you ever feel like your life was in danger yes yes I did there came a time and did you ever worry about the safety of your child Yes, that's that he had never done anything to her ever and um, it's, it was always a good relationship and I think that's one of the pitfalls of, of uh, another reason to stay, oh, my child won't have a father and they have a good relationship and it's, you know, now I have to break that apart and is she going to understand because she really, again, I shielded her from a lot of what happened um, or didn't discuss it in front of her until it, she actually saw something and then that was the time, even though that wasn't the time that I felt like my life could end, but it was um, the time that I thought, you know, her life will change if I stay. What, what, Teresa, what obligation does a parent have to their child in an instance where they are um, experiencing domestic abuse themselves, but there is a child in the house? And what, what, what obligation does a parent have to remove the child from that environment, even if the child isn't being abused personally? I think all of the mothers, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've worked with want to protect their children. 
so um, they do the best that they can. Uh, we have agencies uh, such as CPS to ensure that children remain safe within the context of intimate partner violence uh, occurring in the home. But ultimately, it really is uh, the mother's responsibility, unfortunately, uh, to keep their children safe. If they have an extended family, perhaps they can act as a support person. Uh, but again, all of the mothers that I have ever worked with want to keep their children safe. And that's one of the reasons they risk their lives in leaving uh, the abusive spouse. And we saw with Lelania, once once her daughter witnessed this, she said, that's, that's enough, I need to get out of this. Lelania, did you feel the justice system and or the police department was able to adequately protect you? They actually, they actually did. There was a report filed and, um, and they, he, he left the scene, but they later um, caught up with him, I'll say, <laughs> and uh, it was um, vindicating, I'll say, also, that they really did handle the whole situation um, the best that they could with, you know, dignity to our whole family and keeping it, um, my daughter, aside from even making a report, I didn't want to do it in front of her. I really just wanted to shield her from anything to do with uh, that situation. It really, it's a kind of a shameful situation, at least to me, it is. Um, Detective uh, Diaz, um, there's been a few studies, one by the National Center for Women in Policing, that says that domestic abuse statistics within police families are two to four times higher than the national average. Um, why do you think that is in your experiences working for the police department? I think again um, we're talking about officers who then abuse their significant other, correct? Yeah, I, you know again people deal with stress and um, a lot of officers drink alcohol so um, again it's the same people are the same regardless of their profession and, but especially with uh, police officers they're exposed to a lot of stress and they see a lot of um, sadness and horrible things. Um, so if they don't have a coping mechanism and they drink, then they're just as human as the next person and they'll take it out on their significant other. Uh, Teresa, is there a pattern between abusers and the abused in terms of their own upbringings? Well, we know that about 30% of individuals who were abused as children uh, will go on to become perpetrators of abuse uh, towards their partner. So there's, there's a link, although uh, we can't say for sure if all victims of abuse um, as children will go on to be perpetrators. There's, there's, there's absolutely a conceptual uh, link between the two. Um, Lilania, do you still experience psychological trauma from what you experienced? I, I would say no, only because it was so long ago. Um, I don't want to age myself, but <laughs> I, I really just put that in the past. <laughs> and um, as, as much as I try to shield my daughter from it, I probably psychologically try to shield myself from thinking that it ever happened. Uh, even though it did, and I acknowledge it, and it's a painful uh, memory, but I can put it in perspective and think, you know, that it could happen to anybody. And, you know, people are human and they make mistakes, and some people have psychological issues um, that they'll always deal with, maybe because of their upbringing. Um, I know in this case with uh, my ex husband, he was probably he was probably more affected um, than maybe his brothers and sisters. There was another brother that I think had some violent tendencies um, because they were in that controlled environment. The father never abused the mother, but he was very controlling over the kids. Um, one final question for everyone: What can we do? It's a two-part question. What can we do as a community to better combat interpersonal abuse? And what advice do you have for someone currently experiencing domestic abuse that may be watching our show right now? We'll start, Teresa. 
I think that we need to change the narrative. I think we speak a lot about women and why they stay, and I think this discourse needs to focus on the perpetrators of, of abuse. In terms of individuals who are watching, I would encourage those individuals to trust their own instincts. Women know best when it is time to leave, and um, we inadvertently put women and children at risk when we provide unsolicited advice around leaving the abusive partner. Alenia? And I would say that, you know, speaking to somebody that has um, experience with abuse, um, a doctor, a psychiatrist, um, that can actually give you the tools to work with and make you see what an abuse pattern looks like, because you may not know that you're in that situation until you actually see it in that um, aspect. Yes, I agree. I think seek help. You're not, you know, alone. Um, a lot of times victims feel the shame and they just feel like no one would understand. I think we need to try to take the shame away from the abused victim so that they can use the resources. There are plenty of resources out there that are willing to help and ready to help. They just need to go to them. Uh, but I think if the victim felt less shameful, um, I think that would help. And then they could seek the help that they need. And even the perpetrator, they need counseling professional counseling. I want to thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. No more pencils, no more books, no more teachers, dirty looks. School's out for summer. What this place needed was better graduation rates. So we worked with schools like Henry Ford High, and now they're up 18%. To help us do more good this year, go to unitedway.org because great things happen when we live united. I'm a teacher. Let me tell you what I make. I make learning a privilege, not a chore, and frustration a tool, not an obstacle. I make working hard seem easy and giving up impossible. I make an old subject feel like a fresh thought and unconventional methods common. I'm a teacher. I make more. Don't worry, the 74 people were picked before me in the NFL draft. To fight childhood obesity, United Way and the NFL are helping kids play more. To donate or volunteer, go to unitedway.org slash play60. Now I get it. Thank you for watching On Point. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook by searching CSUN On Point. You can watch us on Channel LA36 on Saturday mornings at 8.30 and Sunday mornings at 11.30. You can also hear the show on KCSN 88.5 FM on Sunday mornings at 5.30. For all of us here at On Point, I'm Candace Curtis.